You're live, man. Cool. You're live. Live streaming. All right. I want to start out talking about natural law. Um, we talk about natural law, the laws of nature and of nature's God. That That is mentioned in the um, Declaration of Independence. What are they referring to there? I believe that they are referring to you know, our, natural, our natural rights. Rights that belong to us before there was any written law. You see, written law is only an instrument to try to capture what natural law already is. Natural law is what God gave us. Um, God gave us dominion over this earth. As we learn in Genesis, at the beginning of time, that he created the earth and he commanded us to um, and gave us the opportunity to um, till and take care of it, to multiply and replenish upon it, and to have dominion over the, the, the plants and the animals. God gave us the right to own and control this land and its resources. And everything we have, the, the clothes you wear, the car you drove here in, the phones you're filming this thing on, everything we have comes from the earth. Everything we have comes from the earth. And God intended on us to be able to live happily by utilizing these things. And, and he did not give that to a government. He did not give that to a collective. He gave that to individuals. So I want to say that the land and the resources belong to the individual. No level of government. So let's talk about, you know, who has the right then to utilize these things? You know, whose right is it to be able to graze grass in this area or use the water in that area? Natural law, again, God's law, determines how that's to be so that we don't have to fight about it. So let's talk about rights. How are rights established? Okay. Any ideas on who has the first, how a right is established? Right, right can't? Government gives it to us, right? <laughs> <laughs> government can't own the rights, and, then, and even so, okay, so rights, rights are established. <clears throat> the first principle is um, prior appropriation. I'll spell it wrong, so I'll just stop right there. Um, prior appropriation, which is the, the, the thought of first in right, or first in, yeah, first in time, first in right. Okay. In other words, you get there first. You establish a right. But getting there first is not enough. Okay, the other part of this is beneficial use. Okay, which is the doctrine of use it or lose it. Okay. Okay, this is how rights are established. Okay, let's, let's think about this for, for a minute. Um, most every state, at least in the West here, has water right laws. Okay, the water right laws, um, if you look on the water registry, what are some, two, two of the most important information on the water registry? You guys know? The adjudicated. Price. Okay, the adjudication, which would kind of indicate how much water there is there. Okay. But uh, it has your name on it, doesn't it? Okay, so your name, you know, it says you're there and it has a priority date. And, and, and when it comes down to, okay, which water right has greater um, value or, or is it, the claim is by the date. If they're going to have to scale back on the water right for one reason or another, the one that is oldest has highest priority. And the newer ones are the ones that would be at risk. Okay. And, and, and then you have to prove up on that water. If you have to beneficially use it, if you're not using that water for a beneficial purpose, you're not using it at all, then somebody else should be able to use that water. Okay, and so you have to prove up. 
But you know what? This applies to to other types of rights too. Really, all rights, not just water rights or grazing rights, but all rights. Um, <clears throat> my brother Am, the one that uh, he also owns a uh, fleet maintenance business, diesel mechanic shop, and he saw some um, inefficiencies in his business and tried. You know, so he's like, I gotta, I, I, he gotta do something a little different. And he had some ideas, and so he. Uh, he began to develop this software and this program on the software um, to better manage his business. And uh, but they were his ideas. They were his ideas. And then he he beneficially put them to use. And and now he's using it in his business. And his productivity went went way up. His his, his costs went way down. And so he can see that that's a benef benef benefit to him. So now he has, you know, he's going to patent that. And it'll be valuable, it is already valuable to him, but it'll also be valuable to sell or to trade later on. And so, so it's not just water rights, and it's not just grazing rights, but all rights are established this way. Anyway, once a right becomes valuable because you've put some hard labor into it and you've made it, made it worth something, now that, that right can be um, uh, transferred. if you want to. Okay, so what are some ways that rights can be transferred? So, so, so uh, transfer is literally transfer some property to children. Heirship. Okay, or so, gifting. In, in, yeah, yeah, inheritance. Inheritance or gifting. Sold, trade, barter. What's another way? Taken. Okay. It can be taken or stolen. Okay. But one other thing we're talking there is is adverse possession. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, good people don't don't do that. So we don't think about it all the time. But adverse possession isn't always de depending. These are definitely adverse. But uh, there are positive aspects to adverse possession. And every state, as far as I know, in the Union has adverse possession laws. And they're there, not, they're there to help protect these rights a lot of, in a lot of cases, actually. Okay. Um, you know, an example might be is if you purchased a house and uh, you, you paid for it, you lived there for so long, but then somebody, you know, down the road going through their attic, their grandma's old ship treasure chest, or whatever you want to call it, and they pull up a, a deed and it looks clean and it seems clean and it's a deed to the house that you're living in, and they come down the road and say, hey, this is my house. And you say, no, it's not. No, it's not. Because, number one, I'm the one here making beneficial use of it. And uh, number two, you know, again, these adverse possession laws, I know each state has a different time amount on this. I know here in, here in Oregon it's seven years. I know Nevada it's only five. California is five. And California is five. So if you, possess, if you possess a property or, you know, for more than the five years and it's never contested, <coughs> And you can rightfully own there's, there's some other laws that or other conditions but true. Yeah. true there are other conditions to that but uh, but they can be they can be a, a protective function for that now um, so you have rights they're established these rights are valuable they can they can be transferred because then they have value and so um, next step is, is how do you um, Maintain these rights. Okay. For a right to continue, for a right to exist, you, you have to maintain it. Okay. The first part of that is that you have to claim that right. You got to put your name on it. Okay. You've got to continually use that right. What would be the last one? Defend it. You've got to defend it. You've got to defend it. 
Okay, now, let's put this thing to the test. See if this is not natural law. We've all waited in line before, have we not? Started out when we were kids in elementary school, at one time or another, and probably way too many times than what we like, we, we've had to wait in line. So let's say this is the item we're waiting in line for. And these are the people waiting in line. And, uh, and, and you know, I think that this is probably pretty common knowledge, isn't it? Did anyone take like a waiting in one line in class 101 in, in elementary? <laughs> no. Do you think waiting in line is the same in Europe or Asia or Africa, any different than what it is here? You know, I haven't been to all those places, so maybe I don't really know, but I would bet that a waiting in line is pretty much just common knowledge. It's just natural. Okay? Um, this person here, um, why, is, why is that his place? Because he was first there. Okay, he made he was the first one there to make prior appropriation. All right, and as long as he remains there, that'll be his place. And number two, and number three, and number four, and number five, and so on. Okay, they have their places there because this is the because of their of their first in time, first in right, so their prior appropriation. And as long as they continue to stay in those places and make beneficial use of it, then it's there. And then it's there. Okay? It, it, depending on what we're, we're waiting for, you know, the value thereof, it might make this position more valuable. Okay? But could he sell or trade that spot? Absolutely. Okay? He could, he could give it away if he wants. Okay? And it could also be taken through adverse possession. Let's talk about, let's talk about maintaining that then. To prevent that adverse possession. Okay, if he didn't claim his spot, then he really doesn't have it, right? If he discontinued to use it, let's say let's say he uh, needed to go to the bathroom somewhere and left that spot, would that spot still be his? No. Okay. You know, it could be. He could, he could ask number two, hey, will you save my spot? You can hold this for me. You know, number two says, yeah, I'll respect that. I'll hold it for you. But you know, if he he went to the bathroom, he's gone for a couple of minutes, and then he's decided he's hungry. He's like, oh, I'm going to go eat lunch, too. He's holding my spot. Okay, but that safe spot kind of wears out after a while, doesn't it? Okay. And it don't last all that long, so you really got to continue to use it. All right, well, let's talk about, let's say this is us down here in, in position four. And uh, here comes a guy. And uh, he's like 350 pounds, 6'5". And he comes and steps right in front of you. All right, now, if you're going to maintain your right, what do you have to do? Defend your spot. Okay, well, what if it's just lunch? What if, uh, you know, it's really not that big a deal. You're going to get, you're going to get your lunch anyway. In other words, depending on what right this is that you're waiting for, what this thing, I guess your rightful spot are these positions, but it depends on what you're waiting for, you might have to make a decision as to the level that you're, you're going to defend. How it come into how much do you value your position? There you go. Exactly. How much do you value your position? Okay. And that makes a huge difference. Again, what did my dad say when it comes to our... Or, right? He said, I'll do whatever it takes. In other words, this level had no limit. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Okay. So now, he's 350, 6'5", and you're, uh, you know, 150, you know, 5'9". What's it going to take? You know, you might just say, you know, hey, sir, you know, it's not right, you know, better than that, you know. You know, and that might be all it takes. It might be all it takes. You know what, he might, re he might honor that and go back. But, but if he doesn't, then you might have to step it up a notch, okay? And if it comes all the way down to the point where you're either going to have to throw him out yourself or it ain't going to happen, 
and you're just not physically capable of doing that, okay, again, you're going to you're going to defend that spot. I mean, he's now he's now claimed it. He now he's now using it. Okay, in other words, he's taken adverse possession over it. Okay, and natural law says the, the longer that he's there, the more his right becomes established. Okay? And if you don't do something about it quickly, I mean, if you wait 30 minutes or even five maybe, you know, then 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 his right becomes established and, and yours has been moved down. In fact, even as new people add to the line, you know, they didn't see him jump in line there in front of you. And so now if you kick him out, you know, they're going to say, wait a second. It appears that he was there. What are you doing throwing a fit? You know, they didn't witness that. So you, can you see how the lack of defense, you know, allows that adverse possession because he's now claiming he's not using it because you didn't defend it. If you fail on any one of these three, you lose your right. You have to, you have to maintain all three. Okay, so so what are you going to do? He's physically bigger than you. You maybe have already done a few levels and it's been, it's been unsuccessful. What do you do? D4, 5, and 6, and 7, and 8, try to pull All right, out. okay, all right. <laughs> See, yeah, it's all right, 4, 5, 6, and on down the line. They've also lost their position it's because of him. Sure, right? And Larry. quite frankly, even though 1, 2, and 3 did not, they, they understand waiting in line 101. Okay? So they might, they might, I'm going to leave those guys that come out late. They weren't here yet. They might all join you in, in expelling in expelling him. All right? What do we, what do we call that group right there? Coalition, country, state, community. Okay, all of those are right. All of those are right. That's government. Protecting the rights of the individual. And that's right. What is the purpose of government? The purpose of government is to assist the individual in maintaining the rights. In, in yeah, to assist the individual in claiming, using, and defending their rights. Okay, let's go to the let's go to the Declaration of Independence. Our founding fathers understood this. Our founding fathers understood this, and they put it in that Declaration. Second paragraph it says, "We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, and they are endowed by their Creator." with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Mm -hmm. That's the purpose of government. Okay? Government's purpose is to assist the individual in maintaining their rights. Okay? So, in this case, you know, you get him rousted out, you know, the government... Fulfilled its purpose and it can dissolve at that point. No longer needed. Okay. But this happens way too often. Okay. Happens way too often. And so our founding fathers again knew that. And so um, they set up a system of government to kind of be in place to readily be there to readily assist us and readily defend, to help us defend. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start out over here again. This is you and I. This is an individual. Okay. And he has his rights. God given. Or those that he established. You know some of the God given rights are our life, our liberty, pursuit of happiness. Okay? These are rights that every man and woman holds. And then other rights that we establish, like the water right, or grazing right, or um, rights of something else you built, like, like my brother's program. Okay, we hold all those rights. And each one of us are a government unto ourselves. We 
have the responsibility to self-govern us. We've been taught by our parents, by our churches, that we should make right choices, that we should, you know, we don't steal because we know it's wrong. We can govern ourselves in that. We don't have to have someone tell us to do these things because we, we are our own. However, in the case of these, this guy here, he couldn't, he wasn't strong enough to completely defend himself. And so we have some levels of government, some shields, so to speak. And the first shield would be our county. And the second shield would be our state. And the third shield is our federal government. Each one of these governments has the exact same duty or purpose to assist the individual. Remember, the rights belong to the individual. They don't belong to any level of government. The governments are simply shields to help the individual claim, use, and defend their rights. Okay? How would the county, how does the county help fulfill this purpose? Like the county sheriff. Okay, the county sheriff's there. And he's supposed to help defend the rights of the individual. Okay, what about the county recorder's office? Okay, as we claim our rights and use them, and we make beneficial use of them and so forth, we can record those rights in the county office. That's where our property, our deeds are. Okay, all of those things... The deed is not what gives you right to your property. The deed is an instrument of documentation that helps you claim it. And so if anyone else comes in and tries to claim your property, you can say, wait a second, I got a claim to this, I got a deed, it's recorded down at the county office. Okay, and so the county is doing its purpose in assisting the individual in maintaining their rights. How does the county help you use your rights? Okay, think about our roads. I mean, we've all got properties. Right. Wouldn't it be pretty tough to get there if we didn't have nice roads? Okay. So in that instance, they're helping us use by helping us access them. And of course, we already mentioned the county sheriff. He's there to help us defend when, you know, he can be a ready government that's already there, ready to help us when somebody comes in and tries to bully their way. <coughs> Again, our founding fathers understood this. And they understood that the rights belong to the individual. That government closest to the people is our, is our closest defense and, and, and should be where most of the most things take place. The state is also there to help and aid in those things. But we saw they saw a need that if we had a, a federal government, a central government, we can give them specific duties to be a shield. And the duties our founding fathers gave to them was to repel the bullies of the outside world. That's why they've been given. They're in charge of national defense. They're in charge with international relations, foreign trade. Okay? Because that's their level of defense. In fact, if you read down through the, you know, the powers that we give the federal government. They pretty much all kind of point to that type that direction. Okay. And the states are there to help defend and to repel federal overreach. And the county is supposed to keep the state at bay. And we are supposed to keep our county in check. But you know what we can do that. It's close enough that it's close enough that we can, you know rub shoulders with our county sheriff, rub shoulders with our county commissioners. They're close enough to us that we can we can influence. The further this goes away, the less influence we have on, on people. And that's why you know our rights are not our individual rights are most protected right here close at, close to home. Um I need to get my narrative down better, and maybe my brother can do it when he gets here. But there are there are um, 
purposes for which the feds can make sure that there's not conflicts between the states. Okay, and the, both the state and the fed are supposed to protect the individual from uh, from other individuals. Anyway, like I said, my, I'm, I need to get my narrative on that a little better, so I'll, I'll take hold on that. Anyway, so let's back up. Let's uh, let's go and talk about um, uh, land. This is a land issue we've been having here because we feel that our rights are being violated because of the land issue, the land and the resources. So now again, our founding fathers understood this. They had just fought and freed themselves from a, a tyrannical monster, the um, Great Britain, and they weren't about to create another monster like they just freed themselves from. Okay, no way. And so to do that, they they did not want the federal government to own large tracts of land. So there's two types of land that make up the United States. This is a land body here. And this is the other type of land body. What are those two types of lands in our country? Private, public, state. Okay, I always get that answer. Well, <laughs> no, I'm glad. I'm glad you bring it up, but it's wrong. It's not private and public. Private. State and what else? Private. No. This is just land mentioned in the Constitution. There you go. Territories. Territory and state. Okay. Those are the only two types of land mentioned in the United States Constitution. Okay. So let's talk about this a little bit. That's my feeble expression of the United States. <laughs> Texas got a little bit weird now. <laughs> well, they've always been a little bit weird. <laughs> okay. The original 13 colonies, um, when they gained their independence and became states, um, there was a treaty signed, the Treaty of Paris. The Treaty of Paris is the treaty that officially ended the Revolutionary War and was the peace treaty that, uh, that ended that. They called it the uh, Treaty of Paris because it was first signed in, in Paris. Um, took a process, they had to bring it over and before they got all the states to sign it. But we learned a lot from that treaty because that treaty um, talks about the qualities of a state. And uh, it's important. Um, I'd like to ask, how many states signed that treaty? Well, we would assume all 13, but okay. all right. it's on the Confederacy. Okay. This treaty didn't do any form of the Confederacy. There was actually 14 states that signed the treaty. Okay, 14 states, but there's only 13 original states, so who was the 14th? exist at that time. Russian, mm -hmm. Okay, it was the state of Great Britain. Okay, all right. Now, the terminology there is important because the state of Great Britain, and now these are the original 13 states. Each one had their own individual name. They each signed it. They all signed it. It wasn't two signatures. It wasn't Great Britain and the United States of America because the United States of America really didn't exist at that time. They were each separate and individual states. The definition of state is the same as the definition of a nation. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now they were all they were all signed, fourteen of them, and it states in there that they were equal and sovereign. Okay, now you got to realize that at this time in, in history, Great Britain was the the greatest nation in the world. They had more land acquisitions and they had more armies and they had, you know, they, they were the major power in the world. 
And now each one of these original 13 states is equal to Great Britain and the standing of the world. That's a pretty big deal, isn't it? All right, pretty big deal. And so that Treaty of Paris, if nothing else, proves that they were separate and equal and, and with Great Britain. Now, they always had intention to join them together. And they did under the Articles of Confederation and later under the Constitution of the United States. Okay, but we call it the United States. Okay, we didn't call it the monarchy or we didn't call it totalitarian. We didn't call it the nation. Okay, it's the union. Union by definition is more than one. You know, you can't just be united with yourself. There has to be several parties involved. And they often refer to it as the several states. Okay, so this union joined together, not totally, but for particular purposes. That each state was still separate and individual in all the other aspects. Okay, the purposes for which we are united are in here. And, um... Okay, now, um... There was some land over here that a lot of these original 13 states had claimed to, you know, west of the Allegheny Mountains, but it was largely unpopulated and largely they didn't really have a lot of control with it. And besides, the Congress had, you know, had accumulated lots of debt that they needed to pay after the Revolutionary War. And so these states voluntarily um, get, relinquished those lands and let um, the new union Congress have control over those, and we call those the Northwest Territories. And in those Northwest Territories, um, the, the process for what happened to them next set precedent, so to speak, of, of how territories be handled. But more so than that, um, our founding fathers put the rules for which Congress must deal with those territories. Okay? And those rules are found in Article 4, Section 3 of the Constitution. And it outlines the, in, in section, let's see, Article 4, 3, uh, Clause 2. It says, Congress shall have power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory. Now, before I go any further than that, I want to talk about the Constitution. I want to talk about all government. Okay, because what is government again? Government is nothing more than us. We are the government. Government doesn't exist except for it's us joining together. Government alone has no power, has no authority. It only has what power and authority we give it. And we can't give it any authority or power that we didn't already individually possess. Okay? <coughs> and so we give each one of these governments certain specific duties to do. And so we give this government certain things to do. And this Constitution is what lays that out. This Constitution is what creates that federal government. This Constitution, in this Constitution, we tell it what duties it can do. And in this Constitution, we give it the power to do those duties, to fulfill those duties. And, and if we didn't give it to it in this Constitution, then they don't have it. And the Tenth Amendment pretty, and calls that out pretty clear. Just read it. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. Laying it out clear. We didn't give it to you, it's still ours. Okay? And then the other thing we said in Article 6 of the Constitution, it said, This Constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof shall be the supreme law of the land. Okay, so no other law can supersede this. All right, so now, let's go back here. We give 
Congress the power to dispose of the territory. Is there anywhere in here that we give the power to Congress to retain? No. No. Okay, so if they have the power to dispose, but don't have the power to retain, then that must mean they absolutely have to dispose of it. Okay? Now, they can make the rules and regulations while it's a territory, but we know that's going to be temporary because they have to dispose of it. They have to dispose of it. Okay? So how might they dispose of territorial land? What are some of the ways they can do that? Sell it to another nation. Okay. Well, they can sell it. I don't know if they've ever sold it to another nation. Well, they can sell it. Okay. Um, and they did. You know, they sold a lot of this land, and again, to pay for the debt that they incurred. Okay. That's just right. What are some other ways? They give it away. Okay, they give it away. You got any examples? Homestead Act. There you go. Homestead Act. They get. They just give it away. And you know what? In doing that. They were helping people to claim it, you know, and encouraging them to go out and use it. They were fulfilling their purpose again. Well, that'd be nice if we could see them do that today, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay. what, 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 however, though, is there any other ways? Can you think of any other ways that might? The, the, the residents of that land could petition to become a state. All right. The ultimate tool of disposal is state. Once these areas become populated enough, once they, you know, their economy became strong enough that they can now become their own entity, their own state, their own nation, they can petition Congress through, you know, and, and, and create an enabling act and, and petition Congress to become a state. And once they become a state, they become equal to one of the original 13 states. Equal in every aspect. Equal to the original 13 states who were also equal with Great Britain. Who Great Britain was the greatest nation in the country at that time. And so each new state becomes equal to Great Britain. Equal in standing with any other nation in the world. Okay, Let me ask you this. Uh, when the Revolutionary War ended, Great Britain left... Um, how much of the land in each state did Great Britain retain? None. Who would have even thought of that, right? No way. Okay? There's no way. Okay? And our founding fathers, again, understood and knew that those who control the land and the resources control the wealth and the ability for a person to pursue happiness. They understood that these things are God-given, that God intended for these things to belong to the individual. And so to prevent any one group or government from obtaining large amounts of, of the land and resources, it has to be kept in the hands of the individual. And so that's why they did not allow the federal government to own, to make, to retain these lands. Okay, so now let's talk about statehood. Okay, it mentions in Article uh, 432 that, that they can make, make full rules and regulations respecting the territory or other property belonging to the United States. So there must be some other place that the United States can own property. So, um, and we do find that. We do find that. We find it in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17. Okay, so now let's go back to the purposes here. Um, well, let me back up here. Let's start, let's start here again. It says, in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17, it says, Congress shall have power to exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such a district not exceeding 10 miles square as may, by session of particular states and the acceptance of Congress, become the seat of government of the United States. Okay, so what, what did they just do there? What did, Con what did, what did our founding fathers just create there? The District of Columbia. That's right. Okay. A 10 mile square. Actually, it's a yeah, 10 mile square. 
So it's 10 miles by 10 miles. It's actually 100 square miles. Okay, and he said this would be the seat of government. We well, knew that if they created this federal government and gave it certain duties to do, it needed a place to function from. Okay, but you know what? That land didn't just come out of thin air. It didn't just come out of the ocean. It had to come from somewhere. It was ceded by the state. It was ceded by the state, by session of the particular states. And I understand, I'm not exactly sure how the way the land is there, but I understand that it come out of parts of four states. Okay, so not one had to give up all their land type of deal. Virginia, Maryland, uh, I was right about the Maryland. Gotcha. gotcha. And, you Virginia, know, so Virginia, those... Maryland. So those states agreed. They ceded that to that. And Congress accepted it. So it became the seat of government. And you know what? We give them exclusive legislation. Exclusive. Which means those states now no longer have any control or power over that land. Congress has exclusive legislation over that. Okay? But again, our founding fathers knew that they were going to need a little bit more land than just a home base to, to operate out of. We knew that we give them responsibilities for military purposes and so they're going to need a little bit more than that so let's see what it says it says here it says and to exercise like authority over all places purchased by the consent of the legislature of the state in which the same shall be for the erection of forts magazines arsenals dockyards and other needful buildings okay so for them to own land in a state they have to, one, get state legislature's consent. Two, they have to purchase it. Again, I'm terrible to spell it. And third, they can only use it for forts, arsenals, magazines, Dockyards and other needful buildings. Okay, so if they needed a dockyard down here to stage their navy from, or uh, a magazine here to store their ammunition, or a fort here, or a, you know some other needful building to fulfill their purpose, and they needed those little spots, they can petition the state legislature. The state legislature could um, give their consent, and they had to purchase it from the rightful owner. But that's all. Again, the federal government does not have constitutional authority to do anything else but these few things. And so when we talk about the lands in the West here, what right do they have to own these lands? Zero of land management, forest service. Zero. It's none. That's not. It's not federal land. As soon as these, as soon as these lands became states, then that transfer automatically took place. Now they would like us to believe that they are still, that it's still a territory, and that they can still make all the rules and regulations, and that is how they are trying to treat it. But we're not territories any longer. We are states. You know, I know that there are some who are trying to get the lands transferred still. And, you know, their, their efforts might be worthy, but um, we say that that doesn't need to happen. We say the transfer has already happened. According to the Constitution, it's already happened. Okay. No need to waste our efforts on that. So then the other question is then, is... How then can the federal government have control over us and our ranches? Okay, again, we've been buffaloed into believing that, you know, we've forgotten that we have, that our ancestors have rights. We've forgotten that our ancestors, ancestors came here and they, they've grazed this land and they've used the water and, and they've created these rights. And throughout time, they've been sold and traded and maybe even we have inherited some of that. But you know what? Our federal government also understands natural law. And they also under, understand adverse possession. And so what they've done is they've come in here and they put their signs on it and claimed it. And then they tend to use it by saying they're leasing it back to us or, or giving us a permit to allow it to get 
us to use it. And they are willing to defend it, as we saw down there in 2014. Okay. But our written law, our founding fathers, didn't allow for that. And natural law that our Creator gave us also doesn't allow for that. And so for the only way for us to get back to where we're supposed to be is that if we reclaim and we begin to use it as our own, because it truly is, not as a renter, and then we'll have to be willing to stand and defend it. And my father said, whatever it takes. Because if you draw a line in the sand and say, that's only as far as you go, I'm sure they're going to push you over. Okay. So now, back to how do they have control over us right now? Okay. We have these little things called contracts. Okay, and these contracts have certain terms and conditions, and we read through them. And when we sign our name to the bottom, that says we agree to those things. Okay. The water and the forage already belongs to us. And we're already using it, but when we sign a contract, we're agreeing to those terms and condri conditions, whatever they might be. And then if we break those terms and conditions, we end up in federal court. And that's part of the deal. I'm going back into some of that stuff I missed earlier about how this defense and court system is supposed to work. And I can tell you what, it doesn't work when we go to a federal court. Because what ends up happening there is they claim it's federal land, and they arrest you with a federal range ranger, and they take you into a federal court with a federal judge using federal codes. How likely is it that you're going to win a case like that? Not much. Not much. <laughs> okay. It's kind of it's kind of like uh, if some man came into your house and abused your wife and children, <coughs> and you said, "Hey, you know this ain't going to happen. I'm going to take him to court." So you go to court and um, to get justice, and you get in there, and they say, "All rise for the honorable judge," and the guy puts on the black robe and sets up at the bench, and he's the very man that abused your wife and children. <laughs> yep. you're not going to win that okay. so we the only way to get out of underneath that is to not sign that contract and if you have one get rid of it because your water rights it, it's on your range you know, they're protected under state law. And your grazing rights are yours. So the only way you're going to get out of underneath that thumb is that, again, you've got to maintain them. You've got to put your name on them. You've got to use them as though your own. And you've got to defend them. And when you don't have a county sheriff that will help you, then you've got to call on your neighbors help you. And that's quite frankly what this militia has done for us. When all else fell, and uh, many of you guys know how it was down there for us, maybe you don't, but we had you know, 200 armed agents, and they had all the latest and the greatest materials and equipment. And they literally laid siege upon us and put surveillance equipment, you know, high-tech sound and sonar or whatever they used to be able to listen to us in our house through our walls from a quarter mile away. And they put snipers on the hills watching us, keeping track of us. Good dogs left now they were.
and they closed off all the roads. And our county sheriff said he wasn't going to help us. And at one point we needed 911 help and my sister called 911 and 911 told us to hang up and not call back if we weren't there. And the state high patrol people, they drove circles around the area, but then when we were attacked, they all disappeared for some reason. That's a pretty alone feeling. Okay, here we are, little ranch family, and we have all this power and might on top of us. And then, Ryan Payne. He's a member of the militias. He called me up. I don't know how he got my number. He says, I'm in Montana. He said, but I'll drive all night and I'll be there in the morning. And he began to gather others that were willing to help. And of course, we started to make some noise. And before you know it, we had 3,000 people there saying, no, Mr. Lloyd, this ain't going to happen. And I don't think it will ever come to that again. I hope not. Hopefully we can have county sheriffs and county commissioners and state governors and so forth that will start doing their job and repelling. Do you know that these, you know that these government levels are not supposed to be friends? You know, they're supposed to be just a little bit of enmity with one another. That way when one gets out of line, the other one can pop them in the jaw and say, straighten up. Again, back to this federal court, you see how they, they join all three branches of government together. They, 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 they are the executive. They become the uh, legislative, making their own codes and regulations. And they become their own judges. Okay, and again, that's un-American because our founding fathers broke those three up. And again, those three branches of government, they're not supposed to be friends with each other either. They're supposed to keep each other in check. And when all three branches of government fail, then it falls back to what some say is the fourth branch of government, which is bureaucracy. <laughs> no, the people. The bureaucracy is an illegitimate form of government. And yes, it does exist, but it's okay. The only way when it gets to this point is just to simply say no. And stand on your own too. Cancel these contracts. Then you can stand on your constitutional rights. I may not have done the best job in that presentation, but what questions do you have?